On February 1st, 2021, the military of Myanmar carried out a coup and seized power in the country's capital, Naypyidaw. Information of the event quickly spread around the world, mainly thanks to a fitness instructor who accidentally captured the event during a routine recording. How can one event to destroy a decade's worth of development and waste the best time in a country's modern history? Let's take a closer look at this event. Welcome to the 20s Report. Discipline flourishing democracy. It's impossible not to start with the figure of Aung San Suu Kyi when talking about the present era of Myanmar. She is the most important figure in the recent history of the country and winner of the 1991 Nobel Peace Prize. She's the daughter of the father of modern Myanmar, Aung San, who played a key role in the country's emergence from the yoke of the British Empire. Aung San Suu Kyi entered Myanmar's politics quite unexpectedly, swept up by the late 1980s revolution in the country. Over the years, she had numerous disputes with generals which cost her 15 years of her own freedom. She's a personality that evokes extreme emotions, from admiration, which resulted in a Nobel Peace Prize, all the way to contempt resulting from her controversial response to ethnic cleansing within Myanmar's borders, or to put it bluntly, the Rohingya genocide. However, it can be speculated that she did the latter as a part of a compromise with the army that was directly responsible for the massacres. Regardless of how one judges Aung San Suu Kyi, she is undoubtedly the central figure of the whole event. The years of the Myanmar politician struggle were interrupted in 2008 by the generals themselves, who decided to change the rules of the game and start the experiment of the discipline flourishing democracy. The junta concluded with a constitutional amendment where the army secured power over three government ministries, was granted full autonomy, and received a guaranteed minority in parliament with the right to veto the constitution. The generals thus secured a soft landing for themselves. Yet this democratic compromise was nevertheless the beginning of a good time for Myanmar. The country gained international trust, opened up to investors, and the rise to high office of Aung San Suu Kyi in 2015 cemented this image. After the victory in 2015, the Nobel laureate, realizing the power of the Tumbata, that is the Myanmar Armed Forces, had assured the generals meant nothing would really change for them. However, after five years, there was probably little to no communication between the parties, and this was one of the factors leading up to the coup. And in the 2020 election, the privileged position of the generals was undermined. Humiliated generals. In November 2020, parliamentary elections were held in Myanmar despite the COVID-19 pandemic. The National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, won an overwhelming victory with 83% of the seats in parliament. The Myanmar army is represented on the political scene by the Union of Solidarity and Development. The latter was humiliated in the last election, gaining only 7% of the vote. It seemed that the unwritten agreement between Aung San Suu Kyi and General Mayong Lin, the commander-in-chief of the Myanmar army, would be upheld and the military would come to terms with defeat while maintaining a strong position in the country. However, the first voices of dissatisfaction began to come from the army in December. Although paradoxically, they were probably the most democratic elections in Myanmar's history. The government of Aung San Suu Kyi did not react to the army's allegations of fabricating elections, while she probably played down the whole situation by rejecting the army's demands. The generals, feeling marginalized, decided to use the tools that were in their hands, military power. Perhaps the army drew their inspiration from the United States, as many Americans, including prominent people, also questioned their own election results, also suggesting that their results were falsified, but likewise did not provide any hard evidence for their claims. Interestingly, at a press conference a week before the coup, a spokesperson for the Myanmar army received a direct question about the coup. He did not confirm it, but neither did he deny it. After all, it was a largely unpleasant surprise. The coup itself was very efficient and well organized. It took place a few hours before the convening of the new parliament after November elections. Troops were positioned in Yangon and Naypyidaw. Telecommunications and the internet were blocked and the army seized government TV stations to broadcast a message that the country had been put in a state of emergency for a year due to voter fraud. The army's narrative was to portray itself as the guardian of the democracy that had been allegedly violated. A lost opportunity? 
The influence of external actors on the coup seems unlikely. China, which has the greatest influence on Myanmar, had good relations with the government of Aung San Suu Kyi, and it was not in Beijing's interest to destabilize this arrangement. Which does not mean that, after lengthy consideration, the whole situation may be in favor of the Chinese. It is likely that Myanmar will continue to come out of the coup with sanctions, mistrust from external investors, and other economic problems. Japanese firms investing in Myanmar have already announced that they will review and thus probably reconsider their investments. For example, Suzuki has halted production and Kirin, a Japanese brewer, has announced a withdrawal from Myanmar. Aid packages from global organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or the Asian Bank are likely to be reduced or completely stopped. The Aung San Suu Kyi government pursued a multilateral policy and tried to wisely balance Chinese influence with the presence of Japanese and or Western European entities. This balance will be in doubt, and the possible options will narrow down considerably. The Myanmar army, although it is not in particular favor of China, may have no choice but to turn to Beijing for help. And for the always opportunistic Chinese, in the end, it doesn't matter who is in power. The only truly important thing is to achieve one's goals in the region. Despite good relations with the overthrown government, the Chinese have an established relationship with the Myanmar army and will talk to anyone who is in charge. The personal ambitions of the generals may, in practice, make Myanmar another of China's colonies. Russia also quickly reacted to the situation. Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu made an official visit to Myanmar shortly after the coup so as to discuss technical and military cooperation with General Meong Lai. Information leaks indicate that the Americans in turn have a problem making any sort of contact with the generals in Myanmar, even if they need to. So in brief, the Chinese have much better information on the immediate situation in the country. Due to its location and natural resources, Myanmar is an important player in the region. The country has over 50 million people and large oil and gas reserves. There are already oil and gas connections with China, which has signed agreements with Myanmar for a number of investments. These include the Sino-Myanmar Economic Corridor, the construction of a railway to Mandalay, the special economic zone of Chao Phu, and finally the expansion of the largest city of Yangon, which already has more than 5 million people. However, many of these investments are only on paper. The Myanmar policymakers wisely approach these projects by accepting but slowing their development as much as possible, not wanting to become dependent on Beijing. Most emotions in recent years have been caused by the Mieson Dam project, which would flood an area the size of Singapore with all energy generated to be exported to China. Despite Chinese anger, the project was canceled in 2011. If this investment was to be resumed now, as well as the other aforementioned investments, it would show Myanmar's caving into pressure from China. What's next? The military in Myanmar has already made ridiculously frivolous charges against Aung San Suu Kyi and elected president Win Mie, who is also from the National League for Democracy. It is likely that night raids on party headquarters and election commission offices across the country are aimed at seizing documents that could help the military build a stronger election fraud case. General Meong Lai, due to the introduction of the state of emergency, has de facto full executive, legislative, and judicial powers for a full year and keeps his opponent, Aung San Suu Kyi, under arrest. However, the question is, what is the next step that the army can take? An example for the generals is the Thai model, where the makers of the 2014 coup had to pacify the popular Pieu Thai party that had won every election since 2001. The junta in Thailand prepared a new constitution appointing the Senate to counter the government and designing a new electoral system that favored them. In a word, they changed the conditions of the game to those that were advantageous to them. A similar course of events may be seen in Myanmar. Moreover, the army hopes that by removing Aung San Suu Kyi from political life, the problem will resolve itself and that no one equally influential and loved by the Myanmar people will stand in their way. Unfortunately, there are many indications that due to the Tammata's attitudes towards Aung San Suu Kyi, as well as her age of 75, it seems that her political career has come to an end. The largest protests since the so-called Saffron Revolution of 2007 are already taking place in the country. They are being suppressed by water cannons and warning shots have also been fired. 
However, a bloody pacification by the army cannot be ruled out, as there are no signs of cracks in the army's grip and no signs of a move to the side of the protesters. Unfortunately, the generals have never been able to tolerate protests in the long run. Every previous mass demonstration in Myanmar against the generals, such as in 1962, 1974, 1988, and in 2007, ended with bloodshed. The years of development in Myanmar made the society much better connected and aware, and the people are disappointed in the current change. This makes it more difficult to control protests than before. However, reversing recent events as a result of grassroots protests seems very difficult and unfortunately unlikely. In the medium to long term, the most likely scenario is an end of the good times that Myanmar has experienced over the past decade. A drop in investors' trust, economic slowdown, and the resulting need to look for a protectorate in Beijing are a likely sequence of events. The only hope would be the collapse of the army's grip and its fracturing into competing cliques. All in all, the truth is that the ordinary people of Myanmar will pay the highest price for the February coup. This was the 20s report. That's the voice you are probably accustomed to while thinking of good times, bad times. Some of you may be surprised, disappointed or happy when hearing another one in this episode. This was Mike's voice and I will talk more about it later. So as I value total transparency with all of you, my audience, uh, let me give you a background of the situation, why I decided to make a move of changing the voice of good times, bad times. First of all, although I speak some English, hopefully, as you can hear, um, I will be never as uh, confident and natural in English uh, voice acting as a native person. Although, obviously, there are exceptions to that rule, like Shirvan from Caspian Report, which all of you probably know, um, I think the voice factor was kind of stopping the proper growth and development of the channel. So, as ancient Stoics would say, uh, I, ha I had to put my ego on, on the side here. What's more, the production of English audio was also quite uh, lengthy, and took me some time to, to put it together. So leaving that to Michael would also you know, give me some time for making episodes themselves and not worrying about uh, the voiceover. So, uh, but speaking about it, you can be sure that the production, the research and all the supervision of the channel will remain the same, meaning that I will still Mm, be responsible for the channel. Let me also introduce Michael. He's not new to the channel because he already helps me with the script editing. Uh, and before that he was a good times, bad times spectator. Uh, I mentioned that because uh, he is not a professional voice actor. But that was a deliberate decision. Uh, because I decided I, that I value more you know, this authenticity and pure interest in the given topics over um, high skill you know, provided by American commercial voice actor who, in my view, would lack certain naturality and, and it would feel artificial. So um, give him a warm welcome, as I hope he will stay longer with us. Okay, it's supposed to be brief. Uh, but anyway, I hope it gave you a better picture of the whole situation and your trust in good times, bad times will remain unchanged. Thank you and I will see you next time. One more thing, a special thanks as always go to Patreons who help us develop that project. If you would reconsider your support, you should have Patreon link somewhere on the screen. Um, comment, subscribe, like. It all helps, so thank you, and I will see you next time.